Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. It's Jane Atkinson here, and I've got one of my favorite clients and one of my favorite topics today. We are talking about designing your dream business. Our guest expert is Peter Van Stralen. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jim. Well, I'm so excited to have you pinned down for the moment because, well, let me have you tell everybody what your life has been looking like the last two years. Yeah, so, well, actually, in our fourth year, since, um, since our business was acquired, we've, uh, I, so my wife and, and three teenagers and I have been traveling around, um, quite, quite extensively. We, we shipped our Jeep over to New Zealand and spent six months over there, um, living in the mountains and on the beaches and just really enjoying, uh, quality time together as a family. We came back and did every state and every province in Canada. So we did really thorough, uh, tour by motorhome and and jeep um throughout north america and really just uh exploring our backyard everything from you know way up in alaska hiking on the glaciers going right out to the end of newfoundland as far as you can go east and walking amongst the the viking ruins and so it's been incredible some incredible experiences we've had along the way and great education for the kids that's amazing. Every time I think about your story and your history, I just get this big, giant smile on my face because I think this guy is living the dream, man. <laughs> I love it. And congratulations. But let's please note for people listening that you didn't land at the top of the mountain. It all started for you with a lawnmower. Talk about the very beginning and this process. Now, we're talking about a different we're not talking about you started with speaking and kind of worked your way through. We're going to integrate speaking in a little bit later on in your history, but to talk about how you got going in the first place with all of this. Yeah. So I was, um, about 16 or 17. My older brother was 18 and uh, we didn't have any money. We grew up in a, in a large family. I actually have nine brothers and, uh, my dad was a school teacher. Um, and so, yeah, we, we were just ambitious young guys. We didn't have any money, so we borrowed a lawnmower off my dad, and we began mowing lawns in our in our neighborhood. And that's a pretty typical story. In fact, I meet people all the time and say, oh, I did that for a while. And, yeah. you know, I maybe put myself through school doing that or whatever, but uh, we stuck to it. So we went from just being a couple of kids with a lawnmower, and we ended up building it um, into a, a large company. And I can kind of go through the... You know, I, I just call them chapters, and I think it's a great way to look at life, not only what's in the past, but going forward, these various chapters, you know, and the first one being the borrowed lawnmower, and I call it, I was just a laborer, um, working hard, pushing a lawnmower, and that was chapter one, approximately five years, um, and that, that was, those were the building years. I mean, we were, um, we we didn't have a well-recognized brand, we didn't have a long list of happy customers. So we really could, the only way we could compete was to outwork everybody else. And, and so we, we went to work doing that. And it was about, you know, the first chapter of five years uh, working as a laborer, but at the same time, I put myself through college because I knew that was the, that would open the, the doors of opportunity to, to get into the next chapter of my life. And so I, I became an arborist, which is one of those crazy people you see climbing a a tree with a chainsaw. The tree monkey. Yes, yes. Absolutely. A tree monkey, yeah. <laughs> okay. <One of> those. <laughs> and so, yeah. So, I mean, um, I was able to kind of open the second chapter and be what I call the skilled laborer, not just working as a laborer now, but having a really unique skill that I could bring to the market. And there was a right. demand for it. And you know what I mean? Your first and, brush uh, with expertise, right? As exactly. we know it in our industry today. Okay, good. So you yeah. had ambition yeah, you, even even back then when you were just a kid, you still were very ambitious. Yeah, I think the only thing we had before I brought a skill to the market was just our ability to work hard. So, right. you know, and our parents had kind of 
I, I, I call it a gift they gave us, which is a gift of a work ethic. You know, they were, mm-hmm. uh, they immigrated uh, very young from Europe, from Holland, and uh, with uh, almost nothing and, and had the same gift given to them, learning to work with, you know, and just make something of yourself. So, um, yeah, so we just worked hard, but then I brought a skill to market, which was really cool because then you can, there's a demand for it and you can charge more for it. And um, you feel like, you know, and, and even though it was mostly uh, school uh, learning at that point to, through experiences very, very quickly, you start to build that confidence. And in each of these, both of these chapters, I, I knew I didn't want to stay there. I knew there was more and um, there's got to be a way to graduate to the next chapter. And, and what I learned in that phase, in that chapter was that, you know, you need to really at this point, not just be out there working and having a good time doing it. You need to learn how to run a business, how to really build something that's an enterprise. That's a business. It's not, otherwise you just uh, have a job. A really well, and, in some cases, a well-paid job, but it's you know, true. You're just trading your time for money or in your case, you probably had a few uh, employees at this point. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. We had employees, but they were doing, you know, so they were doing the labor job that I was doing, you know, the five years before that. And so it really depended on me getting up there and doing the skilled labor. And I knew there was a better way. I knew there was a way to scale this, but it couldn't be just me working harder, working longer, doing more hours. And and so I really began to understand what it means to build a business and build a, a brand. See, as kids, we also, we had this dream to not just build another company in an already crowded marketplace we had this dream to build a brand Mm -hmm. something something special something known far and wide for what what we do but even more importantly admired for how we do it and so chapter three opened uh, you know five years as labor five years as a skilled laborer i now began to really focus on what it meant to build a brand and i started to read voraciously and learn from people who had done it and um yeah i began to understand that um it was, well, there were some real key things. And now when people ask me, what, what are those things? You know, you guys did it. You started with the board lawnmower, you built a large franchise organization, boil it down for me. So I developed, and I do this through coaching. I developed what I call the C6 program. It's, it's the first C being culture. We knew that we had to go to work on creating a culture within our organization that could be replicated that would kind of set the foundation for our business so that we didn't have to be watching over our employees all the time um so that they could make decisions on our behalf and those decisions would be made with the best in mind of the customer which in the long term is having the best of the brand in mind and so i i found a quote by walt disney or roy disney i can't remember and he said when values are clear, decision making is easy. And I had we had all these employees now. We were growing as a business, hiring more and more people, getting bigger and bigger, and we we're starting to see a degradation in our quality of workmanship and, and in this brand, and it scared us. We thought, until we get this under control, we better stop growing. And so we kind of slowed down on that side of things and began to focus on getting a culture in place. Now every company has a culture, but unless you're really intentional about it, mm-hmm. you're, you're maybe not the one directing it. And right. so we, you know, we came up with the, we had the word care in all of our marketing materials. We were in the lawn care business and we were really in the customer care business. So we took care and then just broke it down into an acronym. That was a skill I had early on. I, I I loved creating acronyms because then it was easy to teach people. It was easy for them to remember. Right. And it, you know what I mean? So that works right. great in my current business as a speaker. So <laughs> tell cool. us about uh, uh, CARE. What's the CARE acronym mean? Yeah, so it was two acronyms. The first one was Customers First. A stood for Attitude. R stood for Respect. And E stood for Enjoy Life in the Process. And that became our four values. But then we did, I began to articulate what I call our eight principles. And the first one was also an acronym for CARE, which is create a remarkable experience. Mm-hmm. And that became much more than just words. That became the common denominator for everybody on the team. We hired people that understood and were inspired by and excited by and passionate about the idea of creating a remarkable experience. And we were able to determine that in the interview interview process. And then we knew we had a fit, a cultural fit. And so, so when people go ahead. 
Like you're hiring guys who are out mowing lawns. So talk about yeah. that. How do you instill, create a, a, a remarkable experience into people who are mowing lawns? So we're, we're finding, we had a thing, be always be recruiting. We're looking for people that, you know, didn't want to have a career just mowing lawns for the rest of their life. We were looking for people that wanted to create remarkable experiences and mowing lawns was a way that they could do it. Um, and they might've been working at home Depot so, or some kind of big box store and you walk in and ask for the, you know, some help with plumbing and one employee will wave you down and say, I don't know, it's aisle 14. Another right. one will say, another one might say, Hey, you know, come with me and let's, you know, if I don't know it, I'll find out, but I'm not going to leave you until you have what you need. Right away. You recruit that person. <laughs> <laughs> You see, there's somebody who knows how to create a remarkable experience. Hey, if you're ever looking for another job, we've got a, an awesome place to work. Yes, we mow lawns, but that's not who we are. We're about creating a remarkable experience for our colleagues, that's each other, for our, our customers, and that spills out also into our communities. And if that made someone excited and they thought, hey, I can go to work at a place where they feel the way I do about life, it doesn't matter what service we're doing. And that's how we kind of approach the whole recruiting thing. Amazing. And, and this care idea, create a, a remarkable experience has also um, transmitted over to your life. Now, if people want to circle back and get all of the details of what you put into your culture, let's, let's do a little uh, pitch for your book here because I think that it's really some of the things that you did in your company uh, were really quite amazing and I would say revolutionary probably for the lawn care business but even for any kind of franchise because you created a franchise as well and I want you to talk about that next but let's give it what's the name of your book yeah so it's care leadership c-a-r-e with the dot between it so it's an acronym as so we just talked about but care leadership by peter van Sterling. okay you can All find right. it on amazon amazon perfect okay so you've built this business and you walk me through how you got started on the idea of franchising and then kind of where you took that to yeah, so uh, the third chapter was about five years as well, where I learned how to build a brand, and that became very exciting. We got things under control. We we were growing now, and and being able to replicate that amazing, that remarkable experience for our customers at a much larger scale. So then we started to get requests from, you know, companies that we worked for that owned buildings in other jurisdictions that we didn't have anyone there, and we couldn't service them. We thought. Uh, let's investigate some ways to expand and franchising became one of those um, methods of expansion that really appealed to us. And so I went back to, to school to become a certified franchise executive. Yeah. You know, you. you need something to, to be able to open the next chapter. And that's really, that allowed me to open the fourth chapter, which was now sure. franchising and thus okay. began our expansion. And we went across Canada first and then, um, opening in various cities, but we we're everything we had learned before in the, the third chapter, learning how to create a culture and replicate that culture and how to find culture fits really served us well. When we began franchising, we, we knew what kind of people we were looking for and they're everywhere. Once you get clarity on who you're looking for. Wonderful. And so we, we expanded across Canada and then we met a, an excellent partner in the u.s or a hu huge company he's now the world's largest uh, uh service-based franchise company called the dwyer group and the daughter of the founder dina called me up one day and said we want to work with you in fact she she actually said we want to buy your company and <laughs> uh -huh. i was like uh who are you who are you <laughs> but it was, it was way too early for us um but we began working with them expanding throughout the u.s and we got to to about 250 locations across Canada and the U.S. Wow. Yeah. And then so, yeah. uh, and then you were able to have a company. Now, <clears throat> a lot of our listeners are not necessarily thinking about building a company that they can sell, which is why we're not going kind of deep into the, the, all of the things that you did to get there. Uh, but I do hope that people will take into account that when you are developing a team, even if it's you and one virtual assistant or you and your bookkeeper or whatever, I really want you to 
start to think about this leadership right from the get-go and what kind of culture you want to build within your own organization. This is not something that should be taken lightly, even in a speaking business where you kind of see yourself as a one-person shop. So talk about uh, selling the company and then what that allowed you to do. Yeah, so um, the, when the timing was right, it, it just made sense that um, we were – it made sense to sell the company. I became a shareholder at that company, which um, freed up all, all my time all of a sudden. So going 150 miles an hour to having all this free time. Now, it's something we did with our franchisees when they came on board immediately. The first thing we did is we sat down with them and we did what we called design your life. Mm. And that is kind of what we're talking about today. It is. But almost very, very few people, most people will spend more time uh, planning uh, a weekend vacation than they will. <laughs> their life. Their life. That's yeah. so true. That's so true. Yeah, so, Not wealthy speaker I, listeners, though, Peter. This is a group no, that knows no. how to plan for, for everything right. that they want, I hope. That's right. Well, we would sit down with the with the, everybody who came into the organization, including employees, and, and have them draw a timeline and kind of where do you – where do you think you're going to check out 100, 120 years old, make it, make that your timeline and then um, put somewhere where you, you are right now. So if you're in your forties, put a little tick there and it kind of gives you a visual and you go, wow. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm well on my way through this thing. How am I doing towards my dreams? And then many of them say, well, they don't really have clarity on their dreams. You know, most people have clarity on their business goals, but do you have personal dreams? And so few people actually do articulate them clearly and right. put as much value to those as they do to their corporate goals. And so our, our thing was to say, look, let's focus first on your personal dreams. And then your corporate hitting your corporate goals is going to help you get to your personal dreams because uh, uh, that's just what drives a human being. And so we, we began to articulate our dreams. Me, I sat through that class about 10 years ago, nine years ago, and was in exactly the same boat. I, I could rattle off what our corporate goals. I knew exactly what we were doing in the next five years, 10 years, but I, I couldn't put down a dream. So the, the instructor forced me to do that and gave me the mm. permission to do that. And so I wrote something down and, and she said, don't just write a dream, write an impossible dream. And I said, okay, well, since we're doing this, I'll, I'll do it. And I wrote, I want to go on our road trip, uh, three months on <laughs> inhibited no cell phone three months road trip with my family you know I, when i was younger i had gone and seen some of the great parks national parks and like grand canyon and yosemite and banff and jasper and i wanted to show that to the kids so i wrote it down now at the time it was an impossible dream i couldn't i could barely take three days off consecutively uh being a the ceo of our company and so anyway i wrote it down and i said i want to do it within three or within five years that gave me a bit of time to <laughs> punt it down the road a little bit. Right. But what she said was, now write that down on a sticky note and stick it up somewhere when you go home so you can see it every morning. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. That's step two. You know, just writing it down is one, but step two is is keeping it in front of you. And then the third thing was to share it on a regular basis with your family. And so every time I shared our corporate goals at work, which I did that at least once a month, um, I would do the same at home with our family. And so that gave, as a family, you know, you're working hard and you're, there's so many distractions. And sometimes for a kid growing up, they're like, what are we doing all this for? But mm -hmm. having clearly articulated dreams helped us get clarity on that and keep it front and center, top of mind all the time. And so when the time came, when, when the opportunity came to sell or not sell, to, you know, go into something else or not go into something else, we didn't hesitate because our values were clear. We knew what we wanted. We took that sticky note down off the wall and we went. We just went. <laughs> I love it. And and so you sell your company and you, I'm assuming, did you already have this this motor home? No, we didn't. We had been looking at it, at, you know, kind of that's part of our dreaming process was uh, Going putting to a dream board up with we knew what they looked like. We had yeah. them up. We had, we had watched videos and we just went and bought one and hit the road. Oh my and gosh. That's amazing. And so you pull a Jeep along behind you and you go on yeah. tour. And did you have any idea when you pulled out of the driveway that day that you would be gone for four years? 
No, not not a clue. In fact, we we were planning on this for four months. <laughs> or three four months. months. Yeah. But what what happened when you got out there? Did you just recognize that you were creating remarkable experiences for your family, and you just want wanted to keep doing it? Yeah, I mean, we we so we at the end of three months, we had been to some amazing places. The kids were now doing online school, and they actually loved it. But what they really loved was getting out there and seeing things that they were studying. And so there, these are live classes, and the, the teachers are, are saying, um, you know, today we're studying uh, the Vikings in Newfoundland. And they're like, wait a minute. Uh, hey, kids, uh, have you been there? And they're like, yeah, actually, we're there. <laughs> well, why don't you teach the class? So they're, they're getting the chance to tell, you know, they, they were in the Viking site, standing and touching the, the artifacts and just, you know, wow. feeling the whole experience. And so that became a passion for them to keep going. And Carol and I said, we're, we're happy to keep going, but just like in business, in life, it's the same way you, you, it's decision-making is a lot easier when you have clear values. We need to articulate our values and then for our trip, for our new life, our new business. Right. Now I knew I could, I, I, at that point I, I started coaching and I knew I could do that from anywhere in the world as long as I had a cell phone connection. Mm-hmm. And so we sat down and we came up with three values and that's my email address work peter at workplaycare.com it's work the first one work because work is always precedes success and and you got to if you want to get anything in life you have to uh, work for it and so and they the kids needed to have that value of work in order to uh, get through their their lessons you know it's harder to work on a trip and do homeschool when there's a, a surf break uh, 100 <laughs> feet where you're where you're working so work was our first value play was our second value you know we we knew and we see we had seen this epidemic of stress and anxiety in the world and we thought if we could just remember to play like when we were kids you don't find a lot of stressed out kids and that's because they, they just played expecting nothing from it just other than just the play. And so we said that that needs to be one of our values and let's go hiking and let's go down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and camp and enjoy yeah. ourselves. And um, let's climb mountains for no other reason than because they're in front of us. And so play became our second value. And then the third we brought over from the business, which was care. Now care create a remarkable experience. We create. said if we're, Wow. Yeah, as, as we travel around, let's create remarkable experiences by leaving the people we meet and the places we visit a little better than we found them. And so we knew if we had crystal clarity on what our values were, then we would have a much easier time making decisions. You know, that worked for us in business, it worked for us in our family life, and now it was working on our trip. And so they, the, the opportunities then began to present themselves, and almost immediately upon clarifying our values, an opportunity came to go to Haiti, which isn't really a holiday luxury destination. Destination? Um, Did you go <laughs> post? Well, w- sorry. You you went to Haiti after the um, the storm. Yes, it was after the. Well, they had um, the earthquake in, in the, Port-au-Prince. Right, and you yeah, went post earthquake. A- yeah. Um, yeah, it was a year or so later. We didn't go to Port-au-Prince, but one of the companies we own is Mr. Electric, and they had the idea. They had heard about this village called Ferrier in the middle of Haiti that was extremely poor. They they don't have an electrical grid. Um, the kids that lived there were studying by kerosene lantern at night, and uh, their, their lessons, and there was all kinds of respiratory problems. So someone had the wonderful idea, said, what if we were to put together these little solar lights with a solar panel and a battery? and put 800 of them together and we'll ship them in and then some some people can go down and train the villagers how to use them and we'll solve this this respiratory issue and so we had the privilege of going down um being part of this program or actually we were presented with this opportunity and i think because our value was to care to create a remarkable experience we didn't hesitate we you know even though i put it to the kids and said look we could go to tahiti or fiji or hawaii Mm -hmm. Or to you know where it's going to be luxury and beautiful for the same cost or more. It's, we're gonna we could also go down to Haiti, but I think we'll it'll make a big impact. And they didn't even hesitate; they wanted to go. And now it's sleeping on a concrete floor or on a little cot, and it's it's extremely hot all day and even just as hot at night. And there's no you can't drink the water; it has to be filtered. And um, it's just going to be out of our comfort zone. But let's go. And so we went down and and we spent the 
the days training everyone how to use a solar panel. My, my son was only 13 at the time, and he, just watching him, you know, they speak Creole. It's a language barrier there. It's mm-hmm. a type of French. And so with sign language, he's saying, you know, point the solar panel at the sun, and he's demonstrating, and then the power comes into the battery, and it's stored there, and then you flip the switch, and the light comes on. And some of them had never flicked a, a light switch on before, and just to wow. watch the wonder in their eyes. It was just wow. uh, an incredible experience. And so we kept all the about a hundred families a day, uh, coming in, being trained. And then at the end we brought everybody together and uh, handed out the lights. And then that night, actually, believe it or not, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, but a double rainbow formed right over top of everybody. And Uh. we watched as they walked out into the darkness. And for the first time in history, the village of Ferrier lit up and it was just, uh, just incredible experience. We get back to Miami and we hadn't had, ice in, in our drink or felt air conditioning in quite some time and the kids are sitting there and very quiet they're just sitting quiet and uh i said to after a while i let them think you know through their thoughts and i uh, said to my daughter she's you know a teenage girl i said um so <laughs> what are you thinking what what, what did, how was that experience and she thought about it for a while and said you know dad um I think we have too much stuff. (laughs) Now these villagers had nothing. They had mud huts and yet they were playing and having fun and singing and welcoming us into their homes. And she just got this, this idea, you know, I think I have too much stuff. I just got, I'm just, we have stuff everywhere. We have so much stuff. I I don't need as much stuff. And then I, I, I said to myself, you know, wow, that this experience has been more powerful for us than even mm-hmm. the ones we thought we were going to help out. I asked my son what he thought about the whole thing. And he's he's about 16 years old, and he just looked up after a while, and he said, Dad, I'm never going to complain again wow. <laughs> about anything. And so I realized, you know, uh, we were the ones that actually were having a remarkable experience. And, and it became something I've, I've learned throughout life. Anytime you try to create a remarkable experience for someone else, in business, in life, in any experience, it always comes back to you in in greater measure. And so my last son, Daniel, he's 13, and he's sitting there quietly, and I asked him, Dan, what what did it mean to you? What was this trip for you? And he said, uh, my friend, he had made a friend, roughly the same height, his name was um, Woodley. My friend Woodley, um, does he get to come to Miami and sit in air conditioning? And I said, you know, I don't think so. I mean, they're pretty poor. They have to stay there. And he was, wow. And he just kind of thought about it. And then he goes, he was wearing the same clothes every day. Do they, do they have clothes? It's like he wore the same thing all week. And I said, probably not. I mean, they don't have a lot down there. And he said, well, that's good because I left all my clothes back there for her. Aww. I thought, wow, man, that's pretty cool for a 13 year old. That's amazing. You know, what you're doing yeah. with your kids is so amazing. And, you know, Peter, I could talk to you all day about this. And there's this amazing whale story that mm. you tell from the stage that I'd like to maybe put a link into it. Do we have like a YouTube clip of that we could, we could share with people? Because yeah. I don't want them to miss out on that story, but uh, we are kind of at the end of our time here together. You are out living the dream. Now, we haven't even talked about speaking. You fly from wherever you are, go do your engagement, and then come back, or you bring your family with you like you did. You came down to see me. I don't remember. We've seen each other on several occasions where there's been the motorhome parked at the hotel outside, and the whole family came with you to the gig. Like, How cool is that? How special is that for you? Oh, it's, yeah, like you said, it's living the dream. I, we clearly articulated that as a dream to be able to spend lots of time together. You know, we have a short window if the kids are in their teens, yes. they're going to be on to their own lives in a very, very short amount of time. So we thought, let's just capture that, that time. So, yeah, we, we whenever we can, we'll travel together uh, to a conference or to a speaking gig. Sometimes um, they're, you know, they're having so much fun or they're climbing a mountain the next day and I'm going out they'll drop me off at the airport, wherever, whatever city we are in. So we, there's a bit of logistics there and Mm -hmm. juggling and and you're not getting any bargain flight or anything, but um, it's just, it's just working through it and making, you know, you you were saying to 
to design your life or to design your business, no matter what it is, whether it's um, mowing lawns or as a speaker, you just have to be creative and you have to just do it. You just have to make it happen yeah. and um, uh, and deal with some inconveniences. But in the in the whole picture, it's just uh, it's really re- rewarding to be able to live life on your own terms. And um, you know, we were talking about values earlier building a great culture that definitely definitely applies to um speaking in so many ways maybe you're not building a huge team some some speakers are even if you have one person representing you you want them to understand what makes you tick what your dna is about what your values are so that they can represent you properly even um just bringing someone in who is just doing sales for you but they don't truly understand who you are and what you're about it's seen and and heard in the conversations and in the way replies happen and so on. Mm. So culture is a very important thing, even in a very small organization. Agreed. Agreed. And, and values are how you pick your partnerships because yeah. if you partner up with a speakers bureau or an agency that doesn't hold the same values that you have, then uh, you may have a mismatch and that may prove problematic down the line. Yeah, it certainly will. It'll it'll start to water down your message, and mm-hmm. I think for I know for me, uh, speaking was a natural next thing. In fact, as a CEO, I had opportunities to speak, and I just I felt I loved it so much. It was such uh, it was so wonderful to be able to articulate some ideas to people, and then see the light bulbs go off in their eyes, and see them inspired, and have them come back weeks or months later and say, "Man, that 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 changed my whole outlook," and. Uh, that's why when the opportunity came to become a, a professional speaker and, and, and now in my fifth chapter of life, um, uh, it's just, I'm having so much fun and, and uh, I, I absolutely love it. I love it. And really you could talk about the life that you're living all day long because it's so cool. I think a lot of people want to know about it. Well, wealthy speakers, I think I'm going to, First, I want to say thank you, Peter, for taking the time out of, you know, he, you've literally come off the island to talk to me. You live on the island in the summertime in northern, sure. northern Ontario, which is not too far from where I am. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk to us today. Oh, no problem. Thanks and for having me on. Wealthy speakers, I want to assign you a piece of homework. We are going to put it in the show notes. I would like you to design the perfect life of your dreams. And we have an exercise called the perfect day in your life five years from now. Some of you have already done that exercise. I would love you to, after listening to this conversation, I am hoping you would like to go back and do it again. And we're going to put a worksheet in our show notes so that you can download that and start writing and writing and writing out the perfect day in your life. So with that, uh, I want to say thank you all for listening in. Thank you again, Peter, for being on the show today. And we will see you soon, wealthy speakers. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Wealthy Speaker Show. Please visit speakerlauncher.com for your free Wealthy Speaker audit and visit speakerlauncher.com forward slash podcast for show notes and many more resources to help you catapult your speaking business. See you soon, Wealthy Speakers.